Did you all hear it say this meeting is yeah. being recorded? Yeah. I've never yeah. heard it say yeah. that before. <laughs> oh, yeah. And we get a little notice of do we want to leave or do we want to continue? Do you really? Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that was That's the too. first time. Yeah, first time I've seen that. Yeah. I wonder if that's you. So, probably a uh, European privacy complaint. I, I've been having trouble keeping up with spotlighting whoever is speaking, but now Ron is speaking, so I think it might be easier. <laughs> Go yeah, ahead, I'll, Ron. I'll try and just be one person the entire time. <laughs> um, I'm usually okay with that. So um, we've seen uh, Sumner's progress. We've seen what Emily did. Does anyone else have something that they're working on, a sweater that, that they've... What have you done this week? <laughs> Does anyone want to do a show and tell thing? Well, Vicki Vicky and I got together and worked our way through the shoulders and all of that. And I think oh, we're at the same good. point. So how did Where? it go? Did you did you have an easy time of it, you guys? Um <laughs> I wouldn't say I wouldn't say easy. Um where I where we struggled the most was with the crocheted um neckline cast on we saw it we did watch a couple of videos but um uh, one of them she said okay well here's how you do it and it was just showing a regular crochet cast on and um then she said let me show you a pro tip that gets rid of the gap well of course we're following along i've already done it so i've got this gap here yeah from I, the, I yeah. Too. there are a few things you can do about the gap but mostly when you pick up the neckline it disappears which is kind of what i was thinking is that yeah. that would that would pull it in yeah. but we're both to the point where we're we need to uh divide off the sleeves awesome and do the cast on under the arm i am wondering uh about your statement that you did the crocheted cast on at the neckline the pattern well whatever whatever the, the crochet cable line. cast on it, it's the, the cable cast oh, it's on. the cable cast on cable. Okay. i'm sorry just wanted to make sure you use the right is, one Yes. It's because oh. I just I just read on the you're supposed to do the um, provisional cast on provisional sec um, whatever. Yes, that's the crocheted cast on the provisional under the arm on, only under the arm. You don't use it yeah. anyplace else. It was the cable cast on. Okay, good. So so Ron and yeah. Debbie, I was wondering. You know, I did the same thing, and I and I have. Uh, I have the same loop there mm -hmm. from the table cast on. I, I think on the other side, well, I had to redo because I forgot to put my buttonholes. I'm I'm actually making this for a little tyke. And so I did a, one side open, but anyway, so I had to redo because I forgot my buttonholes. And now I, I have that loop. And I think on the other side, when I had that loop, I, I tightened it up somehow, but I was wondering if there was a, you know, I just pulled the thread through so, and worked it through some stitches. I would show you how I sometimes fake it. Okay, that's what I'm wondering. Uh, so, so solution one is it all comes out when you pick up the stitches, so long as you make sure not to pick up in the gap. That's um, the key. Do not pick up in the, that hole, which oh, is a, just so uh, enticing. It, you just want to go in that hole and pick up a stitch. It's like and you that just makes it push bigger. the button. <laughs> yeah, you think you oh, want to push the button and see what it does. Um, Suzanne, Suzanne Bryan has a very good video on uh, when you get to doing the, um, you know, the, the band around the neck. It's it's really clear her sample about, and she really shows you how to not go in the hole there. <laughs> It's very, it's very clear. Um, so there are a few cheats. I don't know what the video you were watching suggested, um, but let me knit one more row of stock in that in my little micro swatch, if you don't mind. Um, what I sometimes do is cast on the first stitch of the sequence as a backward loop cast on or a half hitch cast on or an E loop cast on or whatever. I just pull up a loop with my thumb for the first one. Yeah, uh, that you can make really tight. Let me, where am I? Here I am. Okay, still one person like I promised. Um, 
So and I'm getting ready here to do my table pass on. One thing you can do is pass on the first stitch in the sequence as a loop. Did you see what I did there? I'm not sure. I yeah. Know. Yeah. Um, and you want to twist that loop clockwise. And then you can really pull the Dickens out of it when you continue the cast on. But to a degree, as I say, that's a solution looking for a problem. Uh, because for most yarns, uh, it will, and then I can continue the cable pass on. It will look perfectly fine despite there being a gap and I fill in the screen. So yeah. that is one way to do it. See, I that's a really yeah. nice technique. I like that, Ron. Thank you very much. The other thing that we tried that didn't leave as much of a gap that we heard in the video was instead of um, was to start the cable cast on another stitch uh, between the last two stitches on your needle. Oh, that's actually what I did, and I still had a I still had a gap. You still had the gap. I think I had a little bit of a gap, but not as big as on the first one. Yeah, what's causing the gap is that you're putting an extra loop around the neck of two of one stitch and two existing columns, and it's visually. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, a lot. Looks and once wrong. that black pulls out, it leaves that triangle shaped hole. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and particularly on the front of the sweater, which is A, where people are most likely to be looking at you. And if you don't have an enormous beard to cover up all your necklines, <laughs> um, that's step one. If you never want to have to worry about what your necklines look like, grow an enormous beard. Um, and then I and, can join a circus. Yeah, fail that. <laughs> Um, if that will not work for you, the, um, the well, step. I want to show you mine because you won't see any gap. I, I get this backwards. I want to show you this side. See, there's no gap, and it's all about how you pick up the stitches. Yeah, mine's that way too. Yeah, you just don't pick up a stitch in the gap. Okay, and the gap will tend to fall um between stitches rather than in a stitch where you would be right mm -hmm. so it's one of these things that looks like it's going to be a malfunction <laughs> but as long as you promise yourself not to try and pick up in that hole um you should be just fine um so let's see do we have any other questions about what's coming up in like the sleeve area i showed my little trick for picking up or for putting stitches on hold. Use that if you'd like. Um, you can see that in the recording of last week. I've done that here. Here's my sweater as of right now. I have crocheted those off uh, just because I like it. <laughs> and we do the crochet cast on in the underarm. Um, and there's that crochet cast on. You can see it okay. okay. I've put up a light now. Um, and the crochet cast on is great in this location because it lets the underarm into sleeve and body run perfectly seamlessly. It's an uninterrupted field of stockinette fabric. Uh, if you put in a uh, provisional cast on and then pick up those stitches and begin knitting the other way. Uh, it is not mandatory. You could do whichever cast on you like under there, uh, making sure that your cast on matches the gauge of your fabric so you don't have a puckery armpit. Um, that's a, I don't know if anyone has ever said the, that particular phrase before. <laughs> um, if your deodorant is sour and your armpit puckers, or if you cast on too tightly, um, you could get distorted <laughs> fabric in there and then you'd be picking up just along the edge of a cast on, uh, like we practiced in other places. Does anyone need a demo of any of that? Or are yeah, we... could you could you show us how uh, real quickly just how to do it? I know I've watched 
Ron's video yeah. on doing it. So um, I will show you the method that I use to do this, which is in a lot of ways cheating. Um, but as my dad always said, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. Uh, so what I, what I do to make a crochet cast on is crochet a loose chain and then pick up into it. Um, Frank has a video up for the more usual, the more typical crocheted provisional cast on, which allows you to put stitches directly onto your left hand needle, is it? That's put right, left. the left hand needle, and then, and then you them. knit them from the, and then you knit them. with the right. Um, and, and that's what I, the pattern uh, suggests you do, but you don't have to do it that way if you have a better way I, of doing it. it. It winds up making the same structure. Your, your chain just won't be on a needle. It'll be floating in space. Um, I will not demonstrate for you the typical method because A, Frank has a video of it. And B, I never do it. And I, <laughs> I, I neglected to practice it before this video meeting. And I, I don't want to suffer the indignity of learning it in front of me. OK. <laughs> Um, the, uh, let me point out that in case you didn't know, the link to the video is in the pattern. And if you printed out the pattern, it's a QR code that will take you to it. Um, and the thing about my video is that it probably disagrees with every other video you will see on how to do that pattern, that crocheted cast on. Because I say, keep the needles parallel. And I found that's the easiest way for me to visualize what's going on. Other people say, put them at right angles to each other and then I can't figure out how to, how to wind the yarn to get it to do the right thing. So anyway, I, I make videos when I think I have found a way that I like to do things that's not typical. Uh, you may find that the typical way to do it is the right way for you. So it's it's whatever is work works for you. I come from a similar point of view to this. I um, I have nothing to say to you about like the long tail cast on that hasn't been said by a hundred other very excellent instructors who have made videos that you can look at. But I don't know. I do have something to say about putting stitches on hold. Who knows? It works for me, and it might work for you. Uh, which is what I like about uh, the whole fiber craft world. It's all very much a kind of pick your mix because everyone has different hands. So let me show you what I do here. Um, I am going to be picking up with, I think these are size eight needle. Here's some needles that I'm going to be picking up with. Those are what I'm using for my sweater. I've got a crochet hook that is slightly larger. This is a 5.5 millimeter crochet hook. This is a um, and then I am using, sorry, this needle has the longest cable in the world and it's flopping up here. This is the yarn I'm using for my sweater. It is a worsted weight yarn. So I've got a slightly larger crochet hook and a slightly finer yarn. Uh, and I'm just going to make a big loose chain. Uh, if you need to know how to make a crochet chain, there are 100 great videos out there for you. So I've made a slip knot. And now I'm going to very loosely chain. Uh, let's say I'm going to pick up 10 stitches for my underarm, which is what is called for in the uh, sample pattern. 10 stitches in the under, underarm, I believe. Uh, so I'm going to crochet a few more than that. Uh, I'm going to make a chain of say 14 to 16. All right. So now watch as I forget how to crochet because I'm on camera. Oh no, I can still do it. So I'm just very loosely making a chain with fine yarn and a slightly larger needle. Right, Janelle, well, why do you use a finer yarn, Ron? Because it will not distort the gauge of the stitches when I pick up into them. Uh, 
that there will be less yarn passing through the center of the stitches that I put in. And I use a larger crochet hook to make sure there's enough room for the yarn I'm using. Okay. If I have if I have one row of stockinette in my underarm that's a slightly different gauge, they will not come take my sweater away from me. But I don't know. I like to. That's why. <laughs> you could just use the yarn you're using. Uh, pardon me while the screen is blank because I'm just going to finish crocheting this chain because I was doing it at an odd angle and it was making me feel weird. Okay. Scissors. All right, so I've crocheted my last stitch here, and then I'm just going to pull this loop all the way out. Later, when I'm going to remove the cast on, I will just get that and pull it out, and it will unzip like the top of the bag of charcoal briquettes, which I can never get to work, but this will work. So this is the top of the crochet chain. It's a series of stacked V's, basically. If you flip that over, you see the lumps on the back. Oh, look at me blow out because of the lighting. Let me try and block the light from that. Oh. No, it's OK, I think. Okay. No, it's fine. We can okay. see it, Ron. So you can see the little spine lumps in the back of the chain. They pop yeah. mm -hmm. like this. Yeah. Chain for yourself and flip it over. It's pretty obvious. Those are what I will pick up into. I'm going to pick up a stitch into each of those in the typical manner I use to pick up stitches. Um, so let me try and adjust my angle. Because I have <laughs> extra stitches, I will start two or three stitches away from the edge and I will insert my needle into one of those spine bucks. Some I forgot how to knit. Okay, there we go. And I have picked up a stitch. Two stitches. I insert it on the, into the spine box. Pick up a stitch. And then you understand he's now working with those sweater yarn. This yeah. this would be attached to the body of the sweater. I yeah, that would. Yes, yeah, I would have just come up the front of my or the, the front of my body would be attached here to this part of the needle, and I'd be continuing on. So you can just crochet a little chain and pick up when the time comes. Uh, I'm not sure how many stitches that is now, but I'm not really doing anything other than a micro swatch. So we'll pretend that's enough. And you see? Okay. I've crocheted stitches. Now, um, this is very much a your mileage may vary kind of situation. That is just how I do a crochet cast on. And I don't have any videos about it. So I wanted to show you. But that, that's what I've got here. That's exactly how I did this. Um, so I'm knitting along in this direction. And when I put the stitches for the sleeve on hold, boop, 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 beep, beep, I had a little crocheted chain to the side. And there it is. So once I, have I lost my swatch? Here it is. Uh, once the time comes for me to make my provisional live again. I pull out that little string that I pulled through. Boop, 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 boop. Notice that it slides easily because he chose a smooth yarn. Yes, do not use your mohair for this. <laughs> uh, and then out it comes. And had I continued to knit, these would be live stitches and not just a coil around my um, around my knitting needle. But that's how that works. And I do believe I demonstrate that in the swatch uh, tutorial that I made. So there are a couple options. The one built into your pattern, 
uh, with, and Frank, I think, is, is right on the money with, I, I think that's part of the reason I do my crochet provisional cast on in this way, because holding them like that to one another is very strange and unwieldy. And so after my second or third time trying, I just went, I will figure something else out. Um, and there you have it. Okay. Any questions about this sleeve, underarm area? <gasps> My mother is calling me. Doesn't she know I'm in an important meeting? She doesn't know. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, um, and really, that's like that is calling me again. Tim, could you call? Hi, her? Mom. <laughs> I'll I'll have Tim call her. My my receptionist. <laughs> um, see what she wants. Uh, she's having her garage floor refinished. I imagine she wanted to show me. <laughs> uh, but yes, once you're past this point of the sweater, you've done all of the magic Franco stuff. Uh, from there on out, you're making three tubes, um, which if you've made the sweater up to this point are not beyond your skill. Um, everyone should be able to make three tubes at that point. Uh, but to, to wind up this section, what I did want to have a little chat about was customizations in the body. If there's something you'd like to play around with, and I just have a few quick recommendations or, or suggestions of things you could do, if you don't mind. And Ron, would this be a good time to talk about the two options for sleeve shape oh, that yeah. the pattern provides? So you'll find there is a toggle in the sweater uh, creation portion when you're at the end, yes? Yeah, it's, it's you could switch when you're starting the sleeve shaping. Yes. Um, there are options for a sleeve that begins at shaping immediately. Which is the a, default. That's what you get naturally if you do nothing. And a sleeve that is worked straight for some time. I don't know what the interval is. It's worked straight for some time <laughs> and then tapers. So there are two built-in toggle options. Uh, that you get. You do, not, you do not pay for one or the other, right? Each sweater can generate either of those options. Am I correct? That's correct. Um, it's in the pattern and you can, it, when you're online looking at the pattern, you can click to get the alternate version of sleeve shaping. Now, the reason I, I used to do all of my sleeves that way with a straight upper arm, then I learned that almost nobody else does and that they are always tapered from the shoulder to the wrist. So I switched and made that the, the usual way to do it. However, I didn't get rid of the first one because um, it's a way to adjust the length of the sleeve. If you change your mind about how long you want this sleeve before, I mean, you measured wrong and you've knitted the whole body and you're ready to go on and you oh, this sleeve's gonna end short of my wrist and I really wanted it over the end of my palm. And the pattern is gonna do a taper right from there down to right there and it's gonna stop. So if you really want uh, a longer sleeve, you can switch to the other type and it will tell you to knit so many inches at the top and you can just add to that number of inches to make the sleeve longer and then do the rest of the tapering that it calls for. And so uh, it's not really so much about shaping the sleeve as it is giving you an option to make it longer. That's why I left it in. It is useful for shaping. If you have an arm like mine, this big fat arm until your elbow, um, I just have like a baloney shaped arm or the entire upper arm, uh, which is good for me. Things that taper too soon, too close to my underarm. Um, well, I always wear V-necks and short sleeves and it's because I can't stand fabric touching those parts of my body. But if you have that body shape where you don't have like biceps so much as luncheon meat, then it works well for you. Um, 
That's right. It's, a, it's I, the I will other reason I'm, we're doing it. I am describing my own body when I say luncheon meat. You can describe yourself however you like. Um, and the other thing about it is, um, uh, did I forget what the other thing was? <laughs> Tune in next week when we find oh, out. Oh, I know. <laughs> Do not use it for changing the length of your sleeve if you decide you only want a three-quarter length sleeve or a short sleeve. In that case, you leave the sleeve tapered the way it's described and you just stop knitting at the, at the length that you get it to. So if you want a sleeve that's three quarter length, the pattern says knit it down to here. Instead, you knit it to there and stop and do your ribbing if you wanna do ribbing or if you, whatever fringe you want on the end. So that's how you make sleeves of different length. I did publish a short sleeve t-shirt um, which just has a two inch sleeve at the top. And then you, I just cut the pattern off after two inches was, was knitted. Yeah, that's exactly how you make a t-shirt, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that my, my uh, super bulky sweater for myself, I just stopped. That's right. Um, Go ahead, Ron. All right. So uh, yeah, I just wanted to talk about some things you could, you could do now in the body if you feel like playing around. In fact, at any point in the sweater itself, it is very, very easy to add stripes, particularly if you have another colorway of the same yarn. And there can, of course, be differences in grist because of the dye and the whatever. That's vanishingly unlikely. So I would just say that if you're using another colorway of the same yarn, you should be able to just make stripes however you'd like, putting them wherever you'd like them and continuing on. Um, and so that is probably the most straightforward way of customizing the sweater, uh, simply changing yarns when you feel like it. Um, there are a couple other things that I wanted to bring up <laughs> particularly, and I just inhaled part of my beard, sorry. Life of the beard. Okay. Um, strand knitting uh, is very, very easy to do in the round. It's wonderful. For, am I making that noise? Is someone using a walkie talkie? Maybe it's me. Okay. Um, what on earth is I going to say? Oh, yes. But if you're using both stranded knitting and plain stock and net, it will behoove you to swatch both of those. And uh, if, you, if you're using it in the body, check your stitch gauge and add, in all likelihood, stitches for the stranded knit section. Because you'll find that stranded knitting, almost universally, is narrower than plain knitting. Uh, so if you want your body to not <coughs> change sizes, swatching both of those patterns and then making increases as you need to make them uh, will give you a nice um, finish there. Um, there are some things, let's see. Um, so stick dictionaries that have, I, I pulled the, you've seen my purple sweater. Yeah, I just pulled that design out of Starmore. Uh, just found one that I liked and stuck it in there um, with no real thought about it. The uh, other thing, if you want to add cables, and I cannot find my copy of Nora Gon's book on cables. It is gone. <laughs> um, my Nora Gon book is gone. Uh, but she has uh, a little chapter or preface in there where she discusses stockinette stitch equivalency uh, because Cables are, of course, much narrower than plain knitting. So if you're going to insert cables into your work, knowing how wide that is, if it were a stockinette, is important. You'll need to put in some extra stitches to regauge there. But as I say, stripes at this, at this point in the knitting, very easy to do. Uh, in this, so this is the top of my little sample sweater. 
And I got to the point where if I had to knit like another inch of stockinette, I was gonna, I don't know what was gonna happen to me. I was going to be diagnosed with canine distemper or something. Um, so below the waist, I decided to do a little lace pattern. And it was just a matter of finding a little lace pattern I liked that had a close multiple to fitting in the number of stitches that I had. If it's yeah. off, a couple hidden increases will do if your gauge is the same. I added eight stitches uh, to get a little extra width in the lace section because I'm making like a little girl's um, dress. Um, and just hid those in, those invisible increases we've all been talking about. I took this as a chance to practice them. And I'm just carrying on with some knitting. Uh, but it's a simple matter to add or subtract stitches to hit a multiple correctly. In fact, the uh, child sample sweater is 120 stitches, which is divisible by a lot of numbers. Um, the prime factorization of 120 is very friendly for a lot of different sizes of stitch patterns. If you wanna practice putting something in to a sweater, uh, this is a good bare bones pattern to practice on because of that stitch number. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I will, I will uh, pretend that Frank planned it that way for us. <laughs> <laughs> he was just like, you know what? A multiple of 60 will be very good for these people to practice putting in stitch patterns. Uh, that was good planning on your part. Um, <laughs> Not saying a word. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that is about all of the, the handy tips I have. Uh, you know, if you want to play with something, grab a stitch dictionary. If you want to use up scrap yarns, go stash diving and make a scrappy sweater. It's, it's very simple to do. Um, one caveat is in this part above the armholes, your row gauge does matter. Um, there are plenty of types of patterns where your stitch gauge matters quite a bit and your row gauge matters not at all really. Uh, particularly from here to here, your row gauge does matter. Uh, <clears throat> the positioning of the increases here, the depth uh, until you reach the armholes is all dependent on your row gauge. Um, so if you make your swatch and then you get the clever idea that to knit your sweater in garter stitch for some reason, um, you might have some difficulty with fit because your row gauge will be very, very different. But below the armholes, really you could do anything at all to the row gauge and just stop knitting when you feel like your sweater is done or at that point your tunic is done or your cassock um, or whatever you've made at that point. And um, that's all for me, I think. <laughs> I think that does it. I, yeah. think, I think our knit along has been great. And it's I really appreciate along. you doing this, Rob. Yeah, it, it was great. So I would like. Um... Frank? Yes. This is Rada. Uh, just Have a minute. Let me find you. Um, I'm just really having trouble with trying to find the speakers. Rana, oh, you're not showing anyway. So, but I'll I'll pin you anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> Wait. Uh, yes, Rana. Have you had a chance to do the video on the invisible increases from June's book? No, I haven't. I have uh, been trying to finish the sweater, which, um, well, I'll show you. I am finally down to starting the ribbing at the bottom. Wow. And um, here it is. That is gorgeous, Frank. Oh my gosh. And there it is. It goes I all can the way see down you. the ribbing. Yeah, I can see where you've been a tad busy. Yes, this is... I took extra time on this sweater because I knew it was going to be a slow job. And it took me uh, longer than usual to design that cable. And because, you know, I didn't just get a cable out of a book because most of them are not triangular and then flow into 
flows of cables, which is what I wanted. So um, I designed it the cable all myself, and then um, knitting it has been a real bear. This is not this is not a novice sweater for anybody. This is for somebody who really likes to do cables. <laughs> it, it has every kind of cable from two stitch wide cables up to two two different styles of six stitch cables. It has five stitch cables, four stitch cable, every other size. <laughs> so it's quite a quite a challenge. So I called it the Celtic Challenge sweater. Beautiful. I'm excited to get that published and it will be published in uh, the, the fall issue, which will come out in August of Cast On Magazine. We are working to a deadline. Yes. <laughs> I can't wait to see it. That's going to look so cool. Oh, I'm glad you think so. Yeah, I like that a lot. And I love working cables too. So, <laughs> so I'm going to try I, I, I've done lots of cables, but I tell you, I have, um, I've learned some things about doing these cables that I didn't know before. So I, I'm going to do a video on um, working all of these cables and uh, as I said, I'm, I like to do, I like to say what I found works for me. And um, I have, for a long time, I have not used a cable needle at all. Mm -hmm. And then I discovered partway through this that on these six wide cables, um, it's actually easier to use a cable needle, but not in the usual fashion. I, I put four stitches on the cable and then I, uh, knit two stitches and then I put two of the stitches back on the cable and I knit and I purl those two and then I put the last two cable tables stitches back on the needle and I knit them so I don't knit any stitches off of the cable needle which is real unusual and I don't know uh, I don't know that anybody else has ever suggested that but I discovered that works best for me so why, why, what's, um, what's the difference in technique? Um, well, for one thing, I'm, I, I don't think I have it here. I'm using one of those little tiny needles that uh, has a sharp point on one end and a, and a crochet hook on the other. So I couldn't use both of them. But before that, I was using one of those wooden stick ones. And I used the smallest one I had and it had a blunt point and I found the point was really hard to get into some of these really tight cable areas. And then I discovered that uh, those last two stitches, which I could easily have knitted off of the cable needle if I had a, two, when I did have a two pointed cable needle, um, it stretched the, those stitches more than if I put them back on the regular needle and knitted them from there. And That's often was... those two sti stitches being stretched makes the left-hand side have distorted stitches, which is a real bane of cables. Yes, yes. That's something I've, I, I never have liked about mine. So that's what I was kind of wondering. Yep, well, that's- that's didn't stretch it so much. That, that's what I found doesn't stretch it as much. That's cool. So I do all of the, three stitch wide cables. Um, no, it's actually one three stitch wide cable that is really hard because it's on the next row after a uh, six stitch wide cable. And it's moving two of those stitches back a stitch that you just moved over six, four stitches. <laughs> and um, and I, I kept dropping the stitches in the middle of trying to do this without a cable needle, even though I did all the other three stitch wide cables without a cable needle and I find that really easy. So I found that my using the cable needle for that three stitch wide cable was was also useful. Um, so I have changed my philosophy about cable needles. It's like if it works better for you, use them. If it doesn't, if it just slows you down, don't use them. So that's my new philosophy about cable needles. It used to be never use a cable needle. You can do anything without a cable needle that you can do with one. <laughs> nearly <laughs> nearly well maybe if you got beyond six stitches it would not yeah. anyway 
So I'm happy that we all had such a good time together and I invite you to come back next week and let's continue to show our work. And um, please go out and tell others about the Franco sweater and, uh, and franco.com because I'm completely dependent on word of mouth to spread the news. And uh, if, Frank, you like, if you like what you've seen here, I would really appreciate it if you could help me get the word out about it. Okay, Frank, uh, is Fatima. Um, yes. I, I still have a question. Um, yes. I'm doing the, the saddle um, sleeve uh, with wool, but I was thinking at the same time to make one in cotton uh, for um, a top. Um, can, can it be possible to make in cotton a, a saddle sleeve? It also stays like normal or the wool keeps more memory for that? No, I, I did a co all 100% cotton one. For um, saddle as well? For a saddle. Actually, I had a, 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 a simple cable down the saddle when, and, mm -hmm. and I published yeah, this that. This was my sweater. idea to make here a cable and yeah. then. Next, yeah. And then I just ran the cable all the way down the sleeve. Mm -hmm. And I, I published that pattern a, a while ago. It was a, a Celtic, um, not, I think I called it the Celtic knot sweater. Mm -hmm. It's, um, but anyway. So uh, Belinda, you had your hand up. Uh, you're being, yes, you're being very modest uh, this evening, Frank, because uh, I understand from Suzanne, she's going to be interviewing you next Saturday. <laughs> yes, she is. So uh, uh, we're all looking forward to that. Why, thank you. Yeah, she's and, been very and, gracious to me. She's, she's a real advocate. And of course, that's a person you want on your side because she, she's, she's an excellent teacher and she has rightfully so many followers. And um, so I feel very privileged that she's uh, spotlighting the Franco sweater. And yeah, many, she mentioned many of you came here. Um, because she let me have a, a period in her. Yeah. Well, she mentioned it today when we had our live stream and uh, that she was going to be interviewing you next week. So there should be a lot of people listening in then. Well, good. <laughs> Hope to see you there, Belinda. I'll, I'll be there. And many of you who, who uh, will be. Bye-bye. We'll say goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank bye, bye. you. Bye. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Frank. Bye. Thanks, Ron. Thank you both. Bye. Great time. Bye, Mary. Bye, Cindy. Bye, Mary. <laughs> Bye, Cindy. Bye, Frank. <laughs> Bye, Frank. Bye, Bye everyone. Emily. Emily. <laughs> Bye. I was glad that Emily was here, here today, Ron. too. Yes, it was nice <laughs> to see you, Emily. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Have a good weekend, all.